Kia ora everybody, good afternoon, everybody good to go. Uh, we've obviously been following the situation in Melbourne very closely uh, and have made the decision based on the most recent decision uh, from Melbourne to do a lockdown in Melbourne. We've made the decision to extend our pause for a further seven days so that it extends the current pause restricting travel uh, from uh, Victoria to New Zealand by a further seven days, uh, taking us through to next Friday. Uh, in addition to that, we are uh, putting in place some further uh, requirements using uh, the Health Act, uh, which the Director-General will run through uh, the detail of shortly. Uh, one of the most obvious ones, which is already in place, uh, is that anybody who has been in one of the locations of interest uh, cannot travel to New Zealand, uh, even if they are no longer in Victoria. They cannot travel to New Zealand uh, for at least 14 days after uh, they have been uh, in that potential place uh, where they could have been exposed to COVID-19, uh, and we're making some uh, further adjustments to, that, to those requirements as well, which the Director-General will, will run through in a moment. We are considering whether further restrictions should be put in place. Uh, that includes things like pre-departure testing, uh, and whether pre-departure testing should apply, and if so, to whom, uh, and we'll make further decisions on that in the next 24 hours or so. Uh, so uh, at the moment, uh, the, the main message is that the uh, the travel has been, uh, will continue to be paused. Uh, there will continue to be some uh, restrictions for those who are no longer in Victoria but who were in locations of interest. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, we have uh, and it's some further instructions for those who are currently in New Zealand, uh, which I'll get the Director General to run through now, and then we can open up for your questions. Uh, thank you, Minister. Kia ora, everyone. So I've got some quite formal language I'm going to use, which is around the legal obligations uh, uh, that the Section 70 notice puts in place, and then I'll explain what it means. So a direction under Section 70 of the Health Act 1956 issued today applies to any person who was in the Greater Melbourne area between the 20th and 25th of May. It requires them to do the following, isolate or quarantine at their usual place of residence or accommodation, contact Healthline and advise that they are a contact, a close or casual contact of a COVID-19 case in Melbourne, to submit for testing at a time and place appropriate to their location and except for reporting and submitting to testing, remain isolated or quarantined at their usual place of residence as advised by a medical officer of health for no longer than 14 days and failure or refusal to comply is an offence under Section 72 of the Health Act 1956. So what that basically means is anyone who has travelled to New Zealand who has been in the Greater Melbourne area since the 20th of, which is last Thursday, the 20th of May, is now required to isolate, be tested and remain isolated until they receive the test result. That is in addition to those who have travelled back since the 11th of May who have or travelled to New Zealand and who have been in uh, a place of interest or in the Whittlesea city area, as previously was required, those people since the 11th of May who have travelled back are required to isolate, be tested and remain isolated until they receive a negative test result. So essentially the, the reason we've gone back to last Thursday the 20th is because that's when the latest cases that have come out of Melbourne, the individual that sparked off that group in a workplace was uh, infectious in the workplace and there are a number of locations of interest that have appeared uh, now that are in the central city where people travelling to New Zealand may well have been. So we're applying a precautionary approach and asking everyone who's been in Greater Melbourne who's travelled to New Zealand uh, since the 20th of May, inclusive, to isolate, be tested and, uh, and remain isolated until they get that negative test result back. Thank you. Will those New Zealanders who we will certainly be endeavouring to get in touch with them. Um, we have contact information from them. That's been part of our Trans-Tasman arrangements, making sure we've got contact information. In some cases it's an email address, in some cases it's a mobile number, or in some cases it's both. Uh, so it really depends on what contact information we have for them. But yes, we will be endeavouring to keep in contact with people. There's a lot of them, so they shouldn't all be expecting to be contacted immediately, although the fastest way to get in touch with them is to send out emails. Uh, those people uh, who are covered, many of those people covered, will already have been receiving updates from health. <laughs> Uh, well, I think we, we're, we're expecting about 5,000. We're expecting around 5,000. What's the risk posed? I mean, do you have any sort of uh, assessment of how the, the risk posed by these 5,000 people? 
Well, uh, we still think the risk is low. However, what we have seen is a big increase in the number of locations of interest now up over 80, and in particular those recent ones over the weekend when there was quite a group of people uh, who are now, have now been identified as, as COVID positive, who were in a number of locations of interest which, which were higher risk, so crowded, close contact and confined bars and clubs and so on. So there's a higher risk there and we think it's pr prudent to just ask everyone who's been in Melbourne to, uh, to isolate and be tested. Minister, what does this decision mean for the upcoming bilateral between Scott Morrison and Jacinda Ardern that is scheduled to take place in New Zealand? Uh, at this point, um, we're still expecting that to take place. Um, people who are travelling to New Zealand for that will be travelling uh, on a dedicated flight from, uh, from Canberra. Uh, that flight should still be able to go ahead. Obviously, the same restrictions would apply there. So if people have been uh, in one of those locations of interest, uh, then they should not be getting on that flight. Um, if we do introduce anything further around um, uh, pre-departure testing, for example, depending on whether somebody falls within the scope of that, then that may, may apply uh, to those people. We haven't made that decision yet. We're still uh, considering that. We'll take some further advice on that before with, we did that. With, with 5,000 people um, set to be affected by this, can you, can you give the public a date on when you would be in contact with them or, or when that would be a isolation by them? Uh, in terms of the people who are in New Zealand, um, we'll obviously be getting in touch with them as soon as possible. What the Director General has just done now, though, um, is uh, provide a legal notification through all of you, through the media, um, that that requirement is now in place. Uh, we'll obviously do everything we can to contact them to make sure that they know that that requirement is in place and that it affects them. What's on the back? I mean, do you wait a couple of days to give people a chance to go and get tested and then obviously that pops up in your system and you can say, right, well, they have been? Or do you just start by putting them now and say, right, this is what you can do? They'll certainly get notification now, um, but in terms of the follow-up, I'll ask the Director-General to comment on that. Yes, thanks, Minister. So they'll get an email pretty quick, promptly. In fact, as the Minister said, that all these people and more have already received an email. There was over 10,000 sent out at the start of the pause. We will follow up with an additional email. There will obviously be notifications through the media, and then we will follow up uh, with um, phone calls. That's the intention, is to use our contact tracing centre to follow the phone calls for those who have phone numbers for. How quickly does that kick in the phone call? Uh, we'll probably start that tonight and continue it through tomorrow. Do you think that they will have been tested? What do you mean? Well, look, our experience in this case is that most people get the message and they immediately isolate and they get the test and then they'll, they'll wait for that test result. Uh, the the follow-up with email and phone is just to make sure they've had that message, so um, I'm expecting a high degree of cooperation. Could, could, could we expect further testing stations to come across the country to, to accommodate to these 5,000 people that need to be tested? Uh, look, we do have good capability. The, the people concerned will be spread across the country. Um, we do have good testing capability um, at its peak. We've been testing up to, I think, uh, you know, where we've got to our real peak, uh, testing up to about 26,000 people a day was our high point. Um, we, I don't think we'll get anywhere near to that as a result of this. So, um, yes, I'm satisfied that there's good you know, testing availability out there for those yeah, who will need to comply. What's your general advice to New Zealanders in Melbourne at the moment? Uh, hunker down, follow the rules. Uh, they're going into a lockdown period. Make sure that you are following all of the rules set by uh, the government over there. Um, if this were to go on for longer than seven days, then we'd obviously provide further advice at that point. On on Uh, look, our pause continues until next Friday. Um, we'll obviously keep things under review. If the lockdown were to end, if we were to be satisfied uh, that the risk at that point uh, had returned to a level where we thought we would you know, resume normal flights, then people would be able to come home. If the, pause for, if, if the pause for, yes, that's right. If the pause for any reason were to continue, though, uh, then we would uh, look at we would look into other options, including whether or not uh, we provided emergency travel back for those who absolutely desperately needed to With come back urgently. You don't expect that in the next seven days. That won't happen in the next seven days. On Tuesday, on Tuesday, you noted that the pause was a close call. Is there a sense of relief now that things have spiralled out of control that we moved? Uh, look, with all of these things, um, you, you always look back on things in hindsight and you decide whether or not you moved fast enough, too fast, too slow, uh, and so on. Uh, the reality here is I think we got this one about right. Uh, I think that we, um, it was a line call, um, but ultimately it was the right one. And is there any indication at this point that it could impact the wider trans-Tasman bubble? Uh, look, ultimately that's going to depend what happens over the next seven days.
This is the first one. I haven't had I haven't had any significant feedback about that so far, um, but obviously we'll keep that under review. Now, for a, a three-day pause, um, we would expect most people would be able to you know to cope with that. Um, extending that out to what will now effectively be ten days, uh, that may well put a lot more pressure on some people. So we may have some more feedback that comes through as a result of that. But we did indicate at the beginning uh, that people could have to uh, isolate. In, 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 in situ um, for a period of time, potentially a couple of weeks, uh, was I think the language that I used at the time. Um, and so we're still within that window now. If it was to go, continue going on, so if this continued to grow in Melbourne, uh, then we would look to other options. We have set aside some rooms in managed isolation specifically as a trans-Tasman contingency. Uh, we do have some other rooms available there at the moment uh, if, we, if we were needing to use them. So for those 10 days, Look, ultimately, they should um, shelter in place, which is what we have told them they need to be prepared to do. And this is what do you expect when it comes to the trans bubble that periodically things like this will happen? I think the reality is, as long as we are living in a world where COVID-19 uh, continues to dominate, and uh, it's easy to forget that in New Zealand at the moment, but it does continue to dominate around the globe, uh, we do have to expect that uh, things are going to be disrupted from time to time. Uh, we've been very fortunate in New Zealand that we have not had a lot of disruption uh, in, the, in this year, um, as, aside from our February issue. Uh, but the reality here is that with Trans-Tasman, that opens up a whole new set of challenges and issues. Um, and we were pretty clear about that when we opened up the Trans-Tasman bubble. And we need to respond quickly to those. And people need to be prepared for the fact that their plans will be disrupted um, when that happens. What restrictions are on people who visit Victoria but not any of the places of interest coming to New Zealand? Uh, so uh, if they have been in Victoria since we started the pause, uh, then they will need to. Then they cannot come to New Zealand. Uh, if they have not been, in, if they've been there, say, in the, a week or two prior, they've not been to any locations of interest. Uh, at this point, they can still come. But as I said, we're considering that over the next, you know, overnight, uh, whether there should be any additional requirements, pre-departure testing, and so on. And if we were to put that in place, who that would apply to? How would be the first disruption to the trans tasman bubble? But based off of the early indications from what you're seeing out of Victoria in terms of the number of cases, the number of locations and the variant at play, is this the most significant challenge to the bubble yet? I think that's probably true. It's certainly the biggest challenge to the bubble in terms of this, the number of cases that we are dealing with here. How will that be policed or enforced, the, the locations of interest? I mean, how do you check? How do you know if someone has actually been there or not? Look, I think there is always going to be an element of honesty here. Um, we do have to rely on people being honest um, about where they have been. Um, the vast majority of Australians, as with New Zealanders, don't want to be responsible for spreading COVID-19. Uh, the feedback that we have had and what we have seen from our own restrictions we've had to put them in place is that people want to do the right thing. Uh, they want to know what's expected of them and we communicate that very clearly and what you've just seen from the Director General is a very clear communication of exactly what's required of people. If things go on for longer you say there's options as a contingency in MIQ, what, what does that look like? Do sort of people come in and stay for free in MIQ? Or? Uh, look, we, we haven't made decisions on that at the moment um, and at this point the restrict the pause uh, is for a further seven days. If it looked like it was going to go on for longer, we would certainly provide further guidance well before uh, you know, the, the, that 10-day period would be up. So it's possible people could be brought over and stay for free? I think if, if, if this continued to grow, if we had uh, cause for further concern, then midpoint, midway through the week next week, uh, people could expect to have further guidance from us on what, what we would do next. Do you, you kind of mentioned that it Look, the reality is um, we're talking thousands of people here, uh, and so um, we, we simply couldn't bring them all back all at once. Um, so there'd have to be, there, there, would, there would have to be some rationing involved. <laughs> How many people do you know have travelled to Melbourne in recent weeks? 
uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but overall trans-Tasman travel-wise, we've seen slightly more people come to New Zealand from Australia than, from, uh, than go travel the other way, but I don't have a state-by-state -state breakdown off the top of my head for that one. I'll probably get that for you, though. Look, I can tell you we've had very good coverage of our Group 1 and Group 2. Um, those are the most at-risk New Zealanders. Those are the people working at the border, the people working in our frontline health settings and so on. Very good coverage there. Um, and we're on our way through Group 3. Things are a bit different in the vaccine rollout between New Zealand and Australia. They're, used, they're still using two different vaccines, Pfizer and AstraZeneca. We're not using the AstraZeneca vaccine in New Zealand at the moment. So there, there are different supply challenges uh, on either side of the Tasman. Uh, and, uh, you know, look, I, I'm confident that well, with the vaccines that we have available, uh, we are as best positioned as we could be. How do we respond to some of the outbreak? Look, people I think are well familiar with our alert level framework. Um, were we to experience something in New Zealand, we would uh, respond to that as we have previously, using our alert level framework as the guidance. And I guess on that for New Zealanders, is this, is this something to be concerned about? Look, COVID-19, I can't reiterate this enough, COVID-19 continues to be something to be concerned about, and it's going to continue to be something to be concerned about for some time. So all of the things that we ask New Zealanders to do uh, around staying home when they're sick, getting tested if they start to show symptoms, um, hand hygiene, scanning their QR codes, all of those things are just as important now as they were last year. Um, people still need to keep doing those things because when anything happens, speed becomes very, very important. Uh, and everybody can be prepared uh, to make sure that we are in a position to move quickly if we need to. That's how we stop having to escalate alert levels. So we're going to have to keep being prepared for quite some time now, at least until the end of the year, possibly into next year. Um, if everybody does that, uh, then, the, then the potential for restrictions in New Zealand uh, is lessened. If the pause is to lift on Friday, next Friday, what, are, what time will it lift? Uh, I think that was a misstatement. I just, I just read it, 7.59. 7.59, sorry. Yeah, I couldn't remember the exact time the first one came into force. Just to clarify the numbers, there are 5,000 people, roughly 5,000, in New Zealand who have recently been in Melbourne, and then we don't know how many New Zealanders there might be in Melbourne at the moment. I'm just check whether the director general has that Yes, number. that's correct. So we had, uh, from the 11th, when we sent the email out uh, earlier in the week on Monday, uh, when the pause came in place, it was about 10,000, so we're thinking about 5,000. We don't know how many New Zealanders have travelled to Melbourne and haven't travelled back, yes. But as the Minister said, actually there's been more travel from Australia to New Zealand than the other way. Uh, and so I'm sure that any New Zealanders who are there, if they start to run into challenges or problems, that uh, will soon get a, a, an idea of that. Will you seek to find that number of um, New Zealanders are stranded over in Melbourne whilst this pause? Look, we'll certainly see what numbers we can get you, um, whether or not we have uh, an ability to track whether they have subsequently returned. Uh, we'll be able to give you a bit of an indication of how many people we think might be in Melbourne, but I'll, I'll see if we can get you a better number. And if some Kiwis have contracted COVID-19 while over in Melbourne, what happens for them? Uh, then they would ultimately need to recover from COVID-19 uh, and be given a clean bill of health before they could come back. Right, so would they have to pay for MIQ while over there? Uh, I am, I am not sure what the Australian charging regime is there, so I'll just uh, yeah. So that will ultimately be up to the Australians in terms of what charges apply there. But we could probably find that out for you as well. So do you have a message to those people that are stuck over there at the moment? Do you feel as though you're, you're abandoning Kiwis that are, that are over there? Well, my message to those Kiwis who are stuck in Melbourne at the moment is, you know, follow the rules in Melbourne. We acknowledge this is a difficult time. It's disruptive. It's probably expensive if you're staying in paid accommodation. Um, that's one of the realities of travelling in, in, the, in the era of COVID. Uh, the, we have been really clear with New Zealanders they needed to be prepared for. Having said that, no matter how prepared you are, uh, it's still a big disruption and it still will have a, a big toll on those people. So I want to acknowledge that. All right, thanks everybody. You're on your own, Henry. Yeah. <laughs>